Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. This week, they found 215 children buried at a Kamloops, B.C. residential school. All of the levels of government admit that it is a mass tragedy, and they have offered um, flags to be flown at half mass. They are saying that they're looking into are there other mass graves sites at residential schools that have gone unfound one of the the questions to be answered is how can it be the laws be written of Canada so that this can't ever happen again that it can't happen to another another group of people that their children are yanked from them and try to made to be more socially correct. The it is it is an absolute tragedy and that the government offering apologies to indigenous people over this and offering reconciliation is a good step in the right direction. In the forestry industry, um, the uh, British Columbia government, you'll hear later on, is changing some directions and giving more of a say to indigenous people who have have uh, logging um, logging companies and logging camps and sites within their traditional territories. They're giving more say about it and they're giving more rights to the income that come with that. Another good step in the right direction. We need to find equality. And we need to make it so that acts of genocide and mass killings of people around our globe is put to an end and we can't. It just simply cannot be done without someone being brought to trial for it. Alright. So other uh, really good things that have happened. You're also going to hear Justin Trudeau as he uh, as part of a keynote speech that he gave to municipalities. And some of the really good good things that are coming out of that with transit and um, the federal government helping municipalities with issues to help people live better. And we're also going to hear from of course the WHO and uh, the Pan American Health Organization as they help try to get vaccine programs started around the world so that we can meet that 80% of herd immunity globally. So um, let's get on and start listening to um, policy and rights this week.
Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Okay, welcome back. And um, we have a segment at the end of the World Health Assembly, um, which was a multi-day, almost a week-long event um, that included uh, different groups from around the world involved in trying to advocate for health around the world, trying to ensure that um, people can exercise that right to medicine and uh, medical treatment and all those things that, that, that we need to sustain a good healthy life. Um, and uh, Dr. Tedros from the World Health Organization, uh, he um, is asking for more collaboration and collaborative resources to help people. He's saying that the more collaboration we have, the better um, the better health care that can be provided, the better doctors can work with all different regions around the world, um, from refugees to those who have millions of dollars to spend on their health can and we can eliminate some of the financial factors through collaboration and through sustained uh, fundraising around the world towards health so let's listen uh, to closing uh, addresses from Dr. Tedros at the World Health Assembly. Your Excellency, Madam President, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. First of all, I would like to thank Your Excellency Dasho Dechen Wangmo for your leadership this week and as chair of the, as president of the 74th World Health Assembly. I would also like to thank the chair of the committee, Dr. Adriana Amaria, of Paraguay and the chair of committee B, Dr. Ifremi Wangiabete of Fiji. Thank you both for your leadership this week. I would also like to thank all member states for the constructive and collaborative way that you have worked this week to address a full agenda of pressing health challenges. I know that the past week is the culmination of months of work for many colleagues, member states and the secretariat alike, who have engaged in long hours of consultations, negotiations, and preparations that have resulted in a smooth and successful assembly. You have adopted more than 30 resolutions and decisions on diabetes, disabilities, ending violence against children, eye care, HIV AIDS, hepatitis, and sexually transmitted infections, local production of medicines, malaria, neglected tropical diseases, non-communicable diseases, nursing and midwifery, oral health, social determinants of health, and strategic directions for the health and care workforce. And this morning, you approved a historic resolution on strengthening 
WHO preparedness and response for emergencies. I would like to thank all member states for the support they expressed for WHO and for making it stronger. The reports of the IPPR, the IHR Review Committee, and the IOSC are unanimous in their view that the world needs a stronger WHO at the center of the global health architecture. There are many recommendations in each of the reports about how to achieve that, and many of these recommendations require further discussion with member states. As the reports all say, and many member states have emphasized, a paradigm shift in the quantity and quality of funding of the Secretariat is a key issue. Throughout this assembly, many member states have spoken about their reliance on WHO experts at all levels for technical guidance. Our staff really appreciate this. But the reality of our funding model is that many of these expert colleagues are on short-term contracts, and even if they are not, their programs have to be planned in a debilitating cycle of financial ebb and flow. Even in the midst of this pandemic, we face a serious challenge to maintain WHO's response to COVID-19 at its current level. Last week, you heard about WHO's coordination in country, the technical support and guidance we provide, the capacity building and training of health workers, the scaling up of sequencing, the critical supplies, the surge deployments, and much more. It all has to be funded. We cannot pay people with praise. And WHO cannot grow stronger without sustainable financing. This is not a new issue. More sustainable financing has been one of my priorities as part of the WHO transformation. However, there have been two big differences at this assembly. First, the message that a strong WHO needs to be properly financed has been amplified by all the expert reviews that reported to this assembly. But the second thing that is different is that we have a way forward. I thank the Working Group on Sustainable Finance for its work so far and for its encouraging interim report to this assembly. And thank you especially to Germany and Björn Kummel for their leadership of this initiative. We look forward to its final report to the Executive Board in January. I also thank Member States for approving the planned program budget for 2022 and 2023. For the long-term strengthening of WHO, I urge Member States to seize this pivotal moment and chart a course to a sustainable financial model through the recommendations of the Working Group. In the medium term, I ask that you fully fund the next program budget. And in the short term, I ask you to fill the significant shortfall in the WHO Strategic Preparedness and Respond Plan with the flexible funding we need to deliver on the promise of the Act Accelerator and save lives. The theme of this assembly is, as you know, ending this pandemic, preventing the next one. The reality is we still have a lot of work to do to end this pandemic. 
we're very encouraged that cases and deaths are continuing to decline globally. But it would be a monumental error for any country to think the danger has passed. The tailored and consistent use of public health measures in combination with equitable vaccination remains the way out. I urge all member states to commit to supporting the targets I set out on Monday to achieve vaccination of at least 10% of the population of all countries by the end of September and at least 30% by the end of the year. One day, hopefully soon, the pandemic will be behind us. But the psychological scars will remain for those who have lost loved ones, health workers who have been stretched beyond breaking point, and the millions of people of all ages confronted with months of loneliness and isolation. And we will still face the same vulnerabilities that allowed a small outbreak to become a global pandemic. The questions the pandemic is asking us cannot simply be answered with new institutions, mechanisms, facilities, or processes. The challenges we face are profound, and so must be the solutions we design. Strengthening WHO certainly means strengthening the Secretariat, but it also means strengthening the bond between member states, which is very crucial. That's why the one recommendation that I believe will do most to strengthen both WHO and global health security is the recommendation of a treaty on pandemic preparedness and response. That could also improve, as I said earlier, the relationship between member states and fosters cooperation. This is an idea whose time has come. We need a generational commitment that outlives budgetary cycles election cycles, and media cycles that creates an overarching framework for connecting the political, financial, and technical mechanisms needed for strengthening global health security. At present, pathogens have greater power than WHO. They are emerging more frequently in a planet out of balance. They exploit our interconnectedness and expose our inequities and divisions. The safety of the world's people cannot rely solely on the goodwill of governments. Every government is responsible for and accountable to its own people. But member states can only truly keep their own people safe if they are accountable to each other at the global level. The defining characteristic of the pandemic is the lack of sharing of data, information, pathogens, technologies, and resources. These are the challenges we are facing, we have been facing since the pandemic started and even before. A treaty would foster improved sharing, trust and accountability and provide the solid foundation on which to build other mechanisms for global health security. For peer review of national capacities, for research and innovation, for early warning, for stockpiling and production of pandemic supplies, for equitable access to vaccines, tests and treatments, 
for an emergency workforce, and much more. A treaty is a promise to future generations to sustain political and financial commitment. Crucially, an international agreement of any kind must be designed and owned by all member states, all. It must be truly representative and inclusive. It must be thorough and carefully considered, but it must also be urgent. We don't have time. There is no reason we can't do both. We must seize the moment. In the coming months and years, other crises will demand our attention and distract us from the urgency of taking action now. If we make that mistake, we risk perpetuating the same cycle of panic and neglect that has held us to the point. We appreciate the strong support expressed by dozens of member states for the idea of a global agreement on pandemic preparedness under Article 19 of the WHO Constitution. More than 60 countries have sponsored it, as the ambassador of Chile said earlier. We look forward to discussing this idea further with member states at a special session of the World Health Assembly in November. You, our member states, have demonstrated this week that with commitment, hard work, and a willingness to compromise, to cooperate, it's possible to find common ground, even on issues where there are deep differences of opinion between you. That same commitment and willingness is needed now. Pandemics are a threat to all of us, so we must work together to build a healthier, safer, fairer future for all of us. The pandemic has taught us many lessons. Among the most important is that when health is at risk, every, every, everything is at risk. But when health is protected and promoted, individuals, families, communities, nations, and economies thrive. That we all know. So we call on all member states to enshrine the right to health in their constitutions, as indeed many have already done. But the right to health cannot, must not, become an empty slogan. It must become the experience of every person in every nation. Madam President, you said in your opening address to the Assembly that leadership is hard to, to define and harder to find. This is a moment for exceptional leadership, for doing the unusual and the unprecedented. We must approach the future with open eyes and open arms. As the Bhutanese proverb goes, I quote, if you want to action great ideas, you need to apply the strengths of a Himalayan mountain, end of quote. And earlier also, Prime Minister of Bhutan said, which I think goes around the same line, we suffer together, we find solutions together. Kadinchi, 
Shukran Jazilan, Shishi, Merci Boku, Muchas Gracias, Spasiva Balshoi, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. As we've all heard by now that there was a tragedy in the in Kamloops, BC, where we find uh, the Indian Residential School, which of course is since closed, but a mass grave filled with, with the bodies of children. And We're going to hear um, Justin Trudeau make a statement about this, um, and whether that statement is enough or not, it is, it is what he had to say about it. Um, I mean, um, along with that, he, um, he's introducing a um, new plan for um, black entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs of African descent in which they have access to um, to to monies to help run their businesses and to help this group of entrepreneurs thrive in the marketplace it is a needed thing um, that we it's 16 hours the marketplace needs to find Equality for all entrepreneurs so that all business owners can make their businesses thrive and help fuel our economy. Small business and entrepreneurship is what help find this country to greatness and it will and it is the same thing that will help drive continue to drive Canada to greatness in the global marketplace. So Let's listen to what Justin Trudeau has to say and listen to what the rest of the assembly has to say about um, new accessibility to funding for underfunded entrepreneurs of African descent. Mary Yang, uh, avec les ministres uh, Ahmed Hussein, avec Barter Tiger, certainement le, le secrétaire parlementaire Rachel Bendayen et uh, les députés, mes amis, collègues, uh, Marcy Ian et Emmanuel Dubois, bien sûr, et certainement notre uh, premier ministre, le très honorable Justin Trudeau. Nous savons que les barrières systémiques sont présentes dans toutes les sphères de notre société, incluant l'entrepreneuriat. Les personnes d'ascendance africaine continue de faire face à des défis pour accéder à du financement euh, de démarrage, de renforcement de capacité euh, et bien d'autres opportunités d'avancement. In a survey uh, published earlier this week by the African, African Canadian Senate Group, Black entrepreneurs identified access to capital as their greatest barrier to success. 75% of over 300 entrepreneurs surveyed said that they needed to find $10,000 to support their business and it would be difficult for them to do so. That is why today is so important. I'm thrilled to announce that starting today, the Black Entrepreneurship Program Loan Fund will begin accepting applications from Black entrepreneurs uh, and business owners across the country through the Federation of African Canadian Economics, or FACE. It's incredible to think how far we have come in the last year. Thank you to everyone who is here who have worked so hard to ensure that Black Entrepreneurship Program is a success and that Black business support organizations who co-developed this fund financial institutions, and Business Development Canada. They all deserve a hearty round of applause. Now, I will turn uh, to my friend and colleague, Canada's Minister for Small Business, Export Promotion, and International Trade, the 
Honorable Mary Eng to share more details. Mary? Well, Greg, thank you so very much uh, for that introduction. And uh, for everyone who doesn't know, it's Greg's birthday. So happy birthday to you. What a great way to uh, celebrate your birthday. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining you from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Wendat peoples. For those of us who are settlers or even immigrants to Canada, it's important to recognize that Indigenous peoples have always been here and that we all have a role to play in reconciliation moving forward. I also want to take an opportunity to acknowledge the tragedy of the 215 children whose lives were taken in a Kamloops residential school discovered this past week. This past September, our government announced Canada's first ever Black Entrepreneurship Program. It is the result of years of hard work and much needed push for change from the Black entrepreneurs and Black-led business organizations. The challenges faced by Black business communities in COVID-19 existed well before this pandemic. So, though our government has been delivering emergency pandemic supports to bridge businesses and workers through this pandemic, today is about long-term change. We know that many Black business owners and entrepreneurs face barriers to accessing capital to support their business. We know how important it is that we deliver solutions, co-develop with Black business organizations to address the unique needs of Black businesses and to ensure lasting change. We have an opportunity and a responsibility to address systemic bar barriers facing Black entrepreneurs. That's why I'm so excited to be here today to launch the Black Entrepreneurship Program's Loan Fund being administered by FACE starting today. Black entrepreneurs and business owners across the country can apply through FACE for loans from $25,000 to $250,000. Altogether, this loan fund represents a total investment of $291.3 million to support the success of Black entrepreneurs. This is not uh, a pandemic emergency support measure. This is long-term systemic change and loan applications will be accepted on a rolling basis. For those in this uh, first phase of the loan fund, our government is investing $33.3 million and I'm excited to announce that our one of our first partner financial institutions is the Business Development Bank of Canada, who will be investing $130 million. Also joining in this first phase is Van City and Alterna Savings. We will get to phase two with the Royal Bank of Canada, BMO Financial Group, Scotia Bank, CIBC, National Bank of Canada, TD, Van City and Alterna, who have committed $128 million, and we're going to look forward to join to them joining us soon. I would like to thank all of the financial institutions for their hard work and dedication over the last eight months, co-developing this very loan fund with Black business organizations, FACE and the Government of Canada to change the way that Black entrepreneurs are supported in Canada. This program would not be possible without all of you, and I'm looking forward to continuing our work together now and into that second phase. Now to qualify for the loan fund, businesses must be majority Black owned, have business registration, a business plan, and recent financial statements or financial projections for startups. And if you're worried about criteria and the next steps, well, FACE will be there with you. They'll answer your questions. And in the coming weeks and months, they're gonna be hosting webinars to answer questions directly from entrepreneurs. Now, in addition to this loan fund, I'm also very thrilled to announce today that we're also gonna be launching a micro loan pilot project in Ontario and British Columbia with credit unions, Alterna Savings and Van City who are gonna be providing micro lending in the range of $10,000 to $25,000 to black entrepreneurs in partnership with FACE. Entrepreneurs and businesses starting up have told us that they need smaller micro loans and we just can't wait to see the success of your pilot. And we're also gonna look forward to welcoming more partners to expand this pilot across the country. Another critical pillar of the black entrepreneurship program is the National Ecosystem Fund that will provide black owned businesses with critical mentorship and training. I know that many of you are eagerly awaiting an update and we will be announcing the successful recipients of the ecosystem fund in the coming weeks. With today's announcement, the black entrepreneurship program is now an over $400 million investment to address barriers facing black entrepreneurs and black owned businesses in Canada. I wanna repeat that we are not here announcing an emergency measure or a temporary solution. 
Our government is committed to working with Black businesses and entrepreneurs and with face and with financial institutions to better serve Black businesses and to change the way that our country supports them to get this critical access to financing. I want to thank everyone who has worked to make today possible, including FACE, the leadership of the Black Business Support Organizations, our incredible advisors in Harriet Thorn Thornhill and Christine Williams, the team at Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, and our financial institutions, which have worked with us over the past eight months to recognize that there is need for change and that we're committed to moving together, all of us, as partners. I want to also thank my MP colleagues in Marcy Inn, Greg Fergus, Rachel Van Dyen, uh, Emmanuel Dubour, for all of your hard work towards making this program a reality. Today's a big step and it is the first of many. And I look forward to continuing to work towards meaningful change and a full implementation of the Black Entrepreneurship Program. With that, it is now my pleasure to introduce my good friend and one of the biggest champions and the biggest supporter of this program in our government and who has been with us from day one when we launched the Black Entrepreneurship Program. Prime Minister, over to you. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone from Ottawa, unceded Algonquin territory. Thank you, Mary, for all your outstanding work as Minister of Small Business, Export Promotion and International Trade. It's great to be joined today by members of our own team and leaders within banks and organizations from across the country. I know you're all committed to addressing structural barriers faced by Black entrepreneurs and business owners, so thank you for being here this morning. But before I get into why we're here today, I want to talk about the heartbreaking news that 215 children were found buried at the former Kamloops Residential School. 215 children. Think of their loving families that they were ripped away from. Think of the communities that never saw them again. Think of their hopes, their dreams, their potential, of all they would have accomplished, all they would have become. All of that was taken away. These were children who deserved to be happy. Most of all, they deserved to be safe. As a dad, I can't imagine what it would feel like to have my kids taken away from me. And as prime minister, I am appalled by the shameful policy that stole Indigenous children from their communities. Our thoughts are with Te Kamloops, Te Swipmuk, First Nation, and with all Indigenous communities across Canada. Sadly, this is not an exception or an isolated incident. We're not going to hide from that. We have to acknowledge the truth. Residential schools were a reality a tragedy that existed here in our country, and we have to own up to it. Kids were taken from their families, returned damaged or not returned at all with no explanations until this week. People are hurting and we must be there for survivors. Later this afternoon, I'll be talking directly with ministers Bennett, Miller, and Vandal, and with all ministers about the next and further things we need to do to support survivors and the community. We promised concrete action, and that's how we'll support survivors, families, and Indigenous peoples. Pour honorer les 215 enfants qui ont perdu la vie à l'ancien pensionnat de Kamloops, ainsi que les survivants des pensionnats et leurs familles, Les drapeaux des édifices fédéraux seront en, ber seront en berne jusqu'à nouvel ordre. C'est important de faire de la sensibilisation et de l'éducation à propos de ce chapitre sombre de l'histoire de notre pays. L'héritage tragique des pensionnats est encore présent aujourd'hui et notre gouvernement va continuer d'être là pour soutenir avec des actions concrètes les survivants, leurs familles et leurs communautés partout au pays. And now I want to talk about today's announcement. Lately, we've been focusing a lot on building back better. Today, we're here to take yet another step in making that stronger, more equal future a reality for all Canadians. Whether it's the business organizations I met last year with Greg, 
or people like Fahie, who I spoke with, with Marcy, about his growing coffee business. I've seen firsthand how hard you as black entrepreneurs work and how much you do to create jobs and lift communities up. I've also heard you when you talk about the challenges you face too. And this includes accessing loans and capital from financial institutions. For far too long, black Canadians have faced systemic barriers when it comes to starting or growing a business. That's why the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund launches today. This $291 million fund will allow Black entrepreneurs and business owners to access loans from $25,000 to $250,000. Today's announcement builds on the work we've already started through the first ever Black Entrepreneurship Program we announced last fall, a program that includes investments in everything from mentorship to financial planning. To Black entrepreneurs and business owners in Canada, our government has heard you and we're working with you because we know that to rebuild an economy that works for everyone, we must break down the barriers you face to create real economic inclusion. On sait que les entrepreneurs des communautés noires ont le talent et les idées nécessaires pour aller loin. Aujourd'hui, avec le Fonds de prêt pour l'entrepreneuriat des communautés noires, on veut vous fournir encore plus d'outils pour réussir. Pour bâtir un pays qui fonctionne pour tout le monde, il faut s'assurer que notre économie soit inclusive. À ce sujet, j'aimerais remercier la Fédération africaine-canadienne de l'économie ainsi que les institutions financières qui travaillent en partenariat avec le gouvernement fédéral pour ce fonds. Avec vous, on va permettre à plus de gens d'avoir une chance égale de faire croître leur entreprise et to realize their rêves. Already, black entrepreneurs and business owners contribute so much to our community and our economy. I think of the black business owners I've met who talk not just about building their own future, but about giving back to those around them. With the right tools and support, these entrepreneurs will be able to create even more good jobs and even more opportunities for people across the country. Supporting black businesses with long-term solutions is an important step forward to build the Canada we want with a strong economy where everyone has a real and fair chance at success. L'annonce d'aujourd'hui est un pas dans la bonne direction, mais on sait qu'il reste beaucoup de travail à faire. On sait aussi que la pandémie a affecté la communauté noire de manière disproportionnée. Pendant qu'on combat le racisme systémique que vivent les Canadiens noirs dans le monde des affaires, on doit aussi continuer à travailler pour éliminer les inégalités ailleurs, par exemple dans le système de santé ou le système de justice. Plus que jamais, alors qu'on rebâtit notre économie, notre gouvernement va continuer d'être là pour s'assurer que la voix de tout le monde soit entendue. Merci. I'm glad now. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. And Justin Trudeau is going to be making a statement with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. There's been a lot of important things that have been happening with municipalities uh, in the lines of new investments into transit um, and infrastructure that leads to better housing. And hopefully in the long run, it actually ends up in creating more jobs and allowing for more affordable housing and for people to actually live better. So let's listen to what is actually brought forth uh, by Justin Trudeau at the Canadian, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities um, as he delivers a keynote speech. This is that empowering municipalities is critical to Canada's economic recovery. Uh, this year's new transit investments, that boosts recovery as well even as they make better transit a permanent federal objective, and for the first time, this includes funding for rural transit needs. 
course, uh, rural progress was a key theme for us in the recent federal budget, which uh, which we saw targeted funding for priorities like disaster mitigation and a new boost for the Universal Broadband Fund. Tout ce progrès repose sur une idée fondamentale. La partenariat fédéral municipal fait avancer notre pays. Nous avançons pour sortir de cette pandémie et nous avançons vers un meilleur avenir pour tous. Les municipalités font partie intégrante de la vie des gens. Nous connaissons leurs besoins, leurs espoirs et leurs rêves. Et plus que jamais, nous les aidons dans leurs défis quotidiens. Grâce à un partenariat solide et en disposant des outils appropriés, euh, nous bâtissons de meilleures vies pour les Canadiens de partout au pays. Ce partenariat exige un dialogue constant et ouvert. Et aujourd'hui, nous nous assurerons de maintenir cette conversation. Maintenant, sans plus tarder, accueillons notre invite d'honneur. My friends, I'm pleased to welcome to our annual conference screen, the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous, mes chers amis. Uh, thank you, Garth, for that introduction and for all of your work as president of the FCM. And thanks as well for uh, listing so uh, impressively all the things we've managed to do together over the past years. But uh, there's lots more we're going to be doing. I know that you're welcoming Joanne Vander Hayden to head things up next, as well as you sure that's not a typo? Mike Savage as the new chair of the Big City Mayor's Caucus. Oh, well, okay. Good luck with that. Good luck, Mike. Um, let me give a big shout out to everyone who has been and will be uh, Im important parts of this team. Uh, I also want to recognize just a few of the outstanding leaders I've had the chance to work with over the last few years. Mayor Iveson, Don, you've been a tireless voice, not just for the people of Edmonton, but for folks across the country as FCM's Big City Mayor's Caucus Chair. Mayor Nenshi, I know that your voice here in this forum and in Calgary City Hall will be missed. Ilmer Labombe, Regis, après autant d'années de service, ton leadership va nous manquer tous. Merci à vous tous. We've got a lot to discuss today. And first and foremost, I must begin with the horrific discovery of First Nations children buried at the former residential school in Kamloops. Our country failed them. It failed their communities and their families. That is the truth. And it is a truth we must all face. On sait que le cas du pensionnat de Kamloops n'était pas un incident isolé. On sait que les recherches se poursuivent pour savoir ce qui s'est passé avec des enfants perdus dans le système des pensionnats autochtones. Et on sait que les dommages causés par ces écoles se perpétuent des générations plus tard et que les peuples autochtones subissent encore de la discrimination et du racisme systémique. Over the weekend, cities and towns from coast to coast to coast half-masted their flags. Thank you. It is vital that as a country, we all acknowledge this appalling and shameful policy of residential schools. In the weeks and months to come, there will be much, much more work ahead. Yesterday, I met with my cabinet to discuss our next steps on concrete action to support survivors, families, and Indigenous peoples. This is work we must all be part of, because as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to actions remind us, any efforts to repair the terrible wrongs done by residential schools can only happen if every order of government takes action alongside Indigenous peoples. This is all of Canada's responsibility as we walk together on the path of reconciliation. Des centaines d'enfants ont été enterrés dans une tombe anonyme. Ça s'est passé ici, dans notre pays. Ils se sont fait voler leur avenir. Leurs familles et leurs communautés n'ont jamais pu les revoir. Le Canada les a abandonnés. En tant que pays, on doit toujours choisir de faire mieux. Chaque fois qu'on fait face ensemble à des défis ou à des horreurs, on doit toujours garder un objectif commun en tête. Celui de bâtir un pays meilleur et plus juste pour tout le monde. Pour y arriver, il faut avoir des conversations difficiles. Surtout 
il faut faire face à la vérité. C'est la seule avenue possible. I've been coming to the FCM's annual conference every year for almost a decade now. In that time, we've done a lot together. But as I look back at this past year, I don't think there's ever been a moment where we've worked more or better as partners. From day one, we knew it would take a true Team Canada effort to beat this pandemic. And yes, there were lots of calls and check-ins with many of you on local hotspots and emergency efforts. But I'm also talking about a Team Canada approach that goes deeper, an approach where we all come together around a common goal and each do our part to get there. Just take the vaccine rollout. We worked hard early in the pandemic to position our government well to negotiate vaccine contracts, handle the international shipments, and coordinate supplies. The provinces and territories are delivering these vaccines to the front lines. And you, as municipalities, are getting people out to vaccine clinics, including with public awareness campaigns that ensure no one is left behind. Pour tout le travail exceptionnel que vous avez accompli, merci. Ça démontre bien tout ce qu'on peut réaliser en collaborant en équipe. Plus de la moitié des Canadiens ont maintenant eu au moins leur première dose de vaccin. Dans de nombreuses régions, le nombre de cas a diminué et les entreprises locales commencent à rouvrir. Par contre, ça ne veut pas dire que notre travail est terminé. En réalité, c'est plutôt le contraire. Cities like Winnipeg are still being hit hard by COVID-19. And right across the country, the impacts of this pandemic continue to be felt on the front lines, in the budgets of municipalities, and by communities wondering when Main Street will be back to normal. That's why we doubled the Canada Community Building Fund, formerly known as the Gas Tax Transfer, and created the Safe Restart Agreement so you can support your communities. And it's why we invested to help many municipalities balance your budgets, and give hard-working Canadians tax breaks. Standing together has brought us this far. It's saved lives and kept small businesses afloat. So once this pandemic is over, and hopefully it will be soon, what reason could we have to not continue to use this Team Canada effort? C'est le moment de poursuivre nos efforts pour améliorer la vie des gens d'un bout à l'autre du pays. Déjà, malgré la pandémie, on fait avancer des projets essentiels. Je pense notamment à l'accès à l'Internet haute vitesse, au traitement des eaux usées ou à ce qu'on fait pour assurer la sécurité des gens. À ce sujet, je sais que la ministre Monsef va vous rencontrer cette semaine pour discuter de la façon dont on lutte contre la haine en ligne pour l'empêcher de se transformer en violence contre les femmes et les filles. Au cours des derniers mois, on a aussi pris des mesures importantes dans le transport collectif pour aider les villes et les municipalités. Au printemps, on a annoncé un financement de plusieurs milliards de dollars pour les infrastructures permanentes de transport collectif, y compris des fonds destinés spécialement aux communautés rurales et aux transports en commun dans les régions. Que ce soit en connectant les gens ou en créant des emplois, ces investissements vont apporter du vrai changement. Et je sais qu'on peut et on va en faire encore plus ensemble. Et ça m'amène à parler d'un autre enjeu qui est important pour nous tous et pour tous les Canadiens, le logement. In too many places, owning a home is too far out of reach. After all, how's a young family somewhere like Vancouver supposed to put away enough money when regular houses cost upward of a million dollars. And in Canada's largest city, it now takes almost 280 months for an average family to save for a down payment. Look, owning a home is a big investment, so it makes sense to rent or stay with family while working towards a down payment. But 23 years to save for a house? That's just not reasonable. Young people aren't facing a housing problem. They're facing a housing crisis. We've got a generation of Canadians who are starting their lives, and maybe hoping to start a family, without the same opportunity as their parents or grandparents to get a first home and build equity and their future. Things need to change. And that's what our government is focused on. Now, 
you know better than anyone that there's no silver bullet for the housing crisis. That's why over the past five years, we've come at this from every angle. We created the National Housing Strategy, which has meant more than a million people now have an affordable place to live. We launched the new Rapid Housing Initiative, something I know many of you advocated for, to make sure Canadians have a safe place to stay during and beyond this pandemic. At the same time, we've made it easier for young people to get into the housing market with the first-time homebuyer incentive. And just this spring, we announced a tax on vacant or underused homes held by foreign owners. After all, a home is a place to live, not a place to park foreign wealth. Bien sûr, la crise du logement ne concerne pas seulement les personnes qui souhaitent devenir propriétaires, pour certains, même devenir locataires n'est pas, pas une option. Dans un pays comme le Canada, et durant une année comme celle qu'on a vécue, personne ne devrait dormir dans la rue. Et je sais que vous êtes d'accord avec moi. Le logement est un droit fondamental. On l'a reconnu dans la loi sur la stratégie nationale sur le logement. Et avec des investissements dans la stratégie nationale sur le logement et un soutien accru à des programmes de traitement des dépendances, on est déterminé à mettre fin à l'itinérance chronique au Canada. Et bien sûr, on va le faire en partenariat avec vous. My friends, the bar is high, but it is within reach. Because let's remember what this means for people. For the senior who now has a roof over her head, for the kids with the safe home they deserve, for the parents building a good life. For them and for all Canadians, we must keep pushing forward. The levers needed to take on the housing crisis exist at all orders of government, from zoning and approvals, to consumer protection, to mortgage rules. We have to take this on together. So I want you to know that, as always, our government is here to be your partner. Through the FCM, you've asked for a more formal, recurring dialogue on housing affordability. Well, here's my commitment to you today. The federal government will be at that table. We're bringing our resources and our tools to the discussion. In fact, just yesterday, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland met with big city mayors to discuss how we make housing more affordable for the middle class. This is just the first of many discussions that she and Minister Hussein will be having with you and with municipal leaders from across the country. Together, as municipalities and the federal government, we can do a lot. Let's remember that a true Team Canada approach needs everyone on side. That's why we will also be reaching out to our provincial and territorial partners on finding solutions to the housing crisis. We all have a part to play in making homes more affordable for Canadians. Au cours de la dernière année, on a vu le genre de résultats qu'on peut obtenir en travaillant ensemble. En continuant sur cette lancée, on va rendre nos communautés plus fortes, plus prospères et plus en santé. Que ce soit pour aider les gens à acheter une maison, assurer la qualité de l'air ou redonner de la vie aux grandes artères commerciales, notre travail se poursuit maintenant et pour l'avenir. Évidemment, comme dans tout partenariat, il va y avoir des moments où on ne sera pas toujours exactement d'accord et des moments où on va voir les choses différemment. C'est normal, c'est sain. Mais ensemble, on va trouver des terrains d'entente et des solutions qui fonctionnent pour chaque ville, chaque municipalité et chaque région. Et ce qu'on a pu faire sur les dernières années, ce qu'on va continuer de faire. Parce qu'on a tous le même objectif, celui de rebâtir un pays plus fort pour tout le monde. Et ensemble, je sais qu'on va y arriver. Merci, mes chers amis. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. BC government has set out for a new vision for uh, the forestry industry, um, and 
the forestry forests are at the heart of BC and the economy was software lumber and old growth forest to, to attract more tourists and there's um, also a lot of issues around allowing uh, more in indigenous and first nations groups to actually be involved with the the lumber how the lumber is actually handled and the trees and the forests are actually handled on the traditional territories so why don't we listen to um, what uh, John Horgan and the minister for uh, forestry actually has to say in this announcement about how they're going to revise the how the um, the forests are actually handled, managed, and stewarded so that they can last for generations to come. Thank you, Premier. And I want to thank you for your commitment to progressive change. And there is no question our forests are important to British Columbians. People across BC are passionate about how we manage this incredible resource. But forest policy in our province has not evolved fast enough to address the challenges facing the sector. In part, this is why we are seeing conflict in our forests and why we com com committed to implementing the old growth report. Recommendations, all 14 of the recommendations, starting with the very first one, the very first recommendation, just having those important government to government engagements and discussions with Indigenous nations. Protecting more of BC's iconic and beautiful old growth forests is important to British Columbians today and for future generations. The vision we are putting forward today is another important step. It will ensure all British Columbians can benefit from our forests for generations to come. That means tackling the challenges in front of us and, and harnessing future opportunities. Forest policy, policy will be guided by sustainability, good paying, community supporting jobs, and improved stewardship as we adapt to an ever changing environment. The new approach will ensure that, and enhance reconciliation by ensuring forest resources are fairly benefit the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral territory that our forests grow. We're laying out a roadmap for change that will ensure a competitive, sustainable future for forest communities, indigenous peoples, workers, and companies. It includes moving forward to support the shift from a high volume to a high volume forest sector, as the Premier so eloquently stated. And that means supporting local manufacturing and taking steps to capture value at every step in the production chain. It will include dedicating a portion of the allowable annual cut to high value producers who are creating jobs right here in BC. And as I've said, British Columbians feel deeply connected to their forests and want to see a forward-looking approach. They have shared their ideas on how forestry can support resilient communities, enable reconciliation, and provide the sustainable products the world will buy. They also want to ensure we are upholding our responsibility to the environment and prioritizing biodiversity and ecosystem health. Our vision is guided by what we have heard through past conversations, like the Interior Forest Sector Renewal Initiative and the Coast Forest Sector Revitalization. And I just want to take this time to acknowledge the work of our previous minister, Deputy Minister, John Allen, and my former colleague, former Minister Doug Donaldson, both who helped us to ensure we got started on the right path to moving forward. This plan is, is interwoven with our commitment to doing things differently, to protect vital old growth stands while supporting workers and communities for generations to come. It builds on the pro progress we've made protecting those over 200,000 hectares of old growth by committing to defer logging in even more areas in BC. We recognize the need for further changes and, and work is underway to identify areas of the province where we can make additional deferrals to protect areas that are at risk of irreversible loss. Responsibly managed forests are a legacy for future generations and we are acting to address challenges of today but also so our children and grandchildren 
can experience the benefits and opportunities that our forests provide. Now, I would like to welcome some of our speakers here today. And first, I want to welcome Chief John French from the Takla Nation to share some comments with us. Welcome, Chief John. Get that right one to yet. Chief John French from the Takla First Nation. Um, my hereditary name is Gulahan. I've been asked to speak here on behalf of the Carrier Second First Nations. First, I'd like to start by thanking Premier Oregon and Minister Conroy for inviting me to speak today about the intentions paper and the beautiful vision that you shared. I would also like to congratulate your government on the positive steps that you are taking to put reconciliation into action. Your government enacted the Declaration of Right of Indigenous Peoples Act is a major step in our shared reconciliation journey. A few weeks ago, Minister Conroy announced an apportionment decision in the Prince George timber supply area that apportioned approximately 1.24 million cubic meters to First Nations tenures. This is the largest percentage of an annual allowable cut that the ministers has apportioned to First Nations in the history of British Columbia. Representing yet another precedent forged through collaboration between the Carrier Second First Nations and the province. Continuing to put reconciliation in action in the forest sector means several things to the First Nations, including enhancing, enhancing our stewardship outcomes for First Nations, ensuring that the use of our resource benefits us as First Nations people economically, spiritually, and otherwise. Ensuring that the use of our resource, ensuring that we are active decision makers in managing our forests. The intentions paper is an important step in ensuring that we as First Nations people take a rightful place as partners and regulatory of the forest sector. We welcome the opportunity to co-develop tools that will provide us with greater access to tenure in our territories. As true partners, we need to have access to tenure volume equivalent to 50% of what our territories contribute to the forest sector. Equal revenue sharing with the province, joint decision making on key statutory decisions. The province's ability to deliver on, the, on its commitments to co-develop these tools with First Nations will be import, the important yardstick in measuring the province's commitment to implement DRIPA. These changes are long overdue and will provide the certainty to all participants in the forest sector in British, that British Columbians are seeking. Masai, thank you. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. PAHO is working urgently working with Haiti over the rising number of cases and they're in trying to get the AstraZeneca vaccine through COVAX into Haiti it delivered as quickly as possible. Um, there are still ongoing issues with um, deliveries from India uh, where the Indian government is holding back uh, deliveries or re redirecting them because of their problem with, uh, with COVID-19. There are other countries, of course, in South America, um, such as Bolivia and Paraguay, that are still having trouble um, with rising cases of COVID-19. Of course, the overall message is that we need, in order for our global society to return to what it was before COVID-19, we do need to get into every country and cause an immunization um, so that we can get that 80% herd Im immunity to be spread around the world. And of course, that is still going to take some time to make that happen um, as 
more developed countries, of course, have already seen more of well over their uh, 80% of the populations um, have at least received their first dose and are now waiting for their second dose. So let's listen to what uh, Dr. Etienne and Dr. Barbosa actually have to say in this latest press conference from the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO. Dr. Etienne is today with Dr. Jarbas Barbosa, Assistant Director of PAHO, Dr. Ciro Ugarte, Director of the Department of Health Emergencies, and Dr. Salim Aldeguerre, Incident Management for COVID-19. Now, I would like Dr. Etienne to share her opening remarks for this press briefing. Dr. Etienne, over to you. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's press briefing. Over 1.2 million new COVID cases and 31,000. These figures have changed over the last underscoring a worrying trend. Cases and towing at an alarmingly. In fact, last week, out of five of the of new infections were here in our region. And countries represented the top five highest rates worldwide. Trinidad and Tobago has declared a national emergency following recent COVID. In the meantime, Cuba continues to report significant in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are still seeing spikes and eruptions resulted in people being moved to shelters. We are also concerned about increasing trends in hospitalized Central American countries also reporting spikes, including Costa Rica, Panama, Belize, and in Honduras, where there are over 80% capacity. In South America, Chile, Peru, and Paraguay have registered declines in new infections. However, Uruguay, Argentina, Again, seeing COVID in infections several are weeks of progress at risk. Bolivia's increase in cases and deaths. Here in the highest number of cases and deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. Despite persistently high infections, nurses are no longer adhering to the public health measures, which we know are COVID-19. And new figures suggest that we may not yet know this WHO announced that COVID deaths are being significantly undercounted. According to many more complications, or from pandemics indirect impacts like disruptions to essential services that have put their health at risk. Although more than 3.4 million since the pandemic started, almost half of this in the Americas. The real numbers may be higher. For 2020, deaths stood at 1.8 million, but COVID's true global 2020 death now estimated at closer to last year. Worryingly, half of these deaths have occurred here in the Americas, demonstrating the oversized outsized impact that this pandemic has had in our region. I wish to spotlight the devastating health, social, and economic impact this virus has had on women. The world, women make up 70 workforce across Latin America and the Caribbean much of the burden of our COVID times. It is women who are feeling the economic impact of this virus the hardest. In our region, women are more likely than men to live in poverty, to take on unpaid work, and to have lost their job during the pandemic's first month. Right now, many Latin American women are facing the impossible choice between earning a paycheck and protecting their health. 
And for too many, healthcare remains out of reach. Unfortunately, as health systems have prioritized care for COVID patients, hospitals and clinics have struggled to provide essential health services that women depend on for their health and well being. According to UN estimates, up to 20 million women in the Americas will have their birth control disrupted during the pandemic, either because services are unavailable or because women will no longer have the means to pay for contraception. But it is not just contraceptive services which are being impacted. Pregnancy and newborn care have been disrupted in nearly half of the countries in the Americas, leaving expectant and new mothers at risk. If this continues, the pandemic is expected to obliterate more than 20 years of progress in expanding women's access to family planning and tackling maternal deaths in the region. Nearly all maternal deaths are preventable and even getting back to pre-pandemic levels of maternal mortality, which were already high, could take more than a decade. We should take a minute to talk about what this means for pregnant women, some of whom may be going through the entire pregnancies without being seen by a doctor at a time when care couldn't be more critical. Like all of us, pregnant women are exposed to COVID-19 infections. But because their immune systems change throughout their pregnancies, pregnant women are more vulnerable to respiratory infections like COVID-19. Once they get sick, they also tend to develop more serious symptoms that require intubation and which can often put the baby and mother at risk. Data from 24 countries indicates that more than two 100,000 pregnant women have fallen sick with COVID in the Americas, and at least 1,000 have died from COVID complications. The risk of death also depends on where you look. While pregnant women have less than a 1% chance of dying from COVID in Argentina, Costa Rica, and Colombia, the risk of death in Honduras jumps to 5%, and the risk remains highest in Brazil at 7%. So as we commemorate this week's International Day of Action on Women's Health, we urge countries to do just that, to act. The evidence is clear that pregnant women are at higher risk for severe disease and hospitalization due to infection with SARS-CoV-2. So we can start by ensuring that women and girls can access the health services that they need, like sex sexual and reproductive health services and pregnancy and newborn related care during the COVID response. We must remember that the challenges and inequities that we face prior to COVID-19 have not gone away during the pandemic. In fact, they've only worsened and we cannot overlook them. That's why we must make protecting the lives of women a collective priority. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.